let's have some fun. So uh, this presentation is basically about uh, the first six months of uh, work that uh, me and Alas did in my army team, which is responsible in, uh, amongst other things, for uh, Kafka. Uh, so if uh, you have inherited a, a legacy Kafka system, uh, this is what you should expect. Um, a few words about me. I've been with uh, AppSpy for the past three years. Um, I started as a backend uh, developer in the RTA uh, team. So I have a lot of hands on experience uh, with the system and uh, how it behaves. Um, and I always try to find loopholes in uh, everything. This has got me banned from several game nights over the years. But it really means that I just uh, read all the documentation and uh, cross my uh, teeth and Right. So, um, yeah. No clip. So today, uh, we're going to start with the backstory, the opening uh, scene for our uh, heroes. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the AppSpire tech stack and uh, what the role Kafka plays in it. Uh, we're going to see some uh, challenges and quick wins. Uh, we're going to talk about a bit uh, about sleep driven design. And we're going to have some uh, QA. Uh, so, what's AppSpire? All of you should know this, but uh, basically, uh, AppSpire is a mobile app tracking and uh, attribution analytics platform. It helps uh, marketeers make uh, real-time decisions on their uh, ad campaigns. Um, yeah. So how does that work? Basically, each time you click on an ad in your mobile phone, that event is sent to us. And each time you, uh, you open an application on your phone, that event is also sent to us. And we do some uh, magic, and we attribute those installs to those clicks, and we can tell you where your users came from. And on that, you know, we have a nice um, dashboard where you can see if your ad campaigns are working well and if you're, if you're uh, spending your money wisely on your ad campaigns. So, AppSwire is pretty successful, so that translates to a lot of requests. Um, so some numbers. We process around 1 million incoming HTTP requests uh, a second. Um, we do that. Uh, so each message that is uh, that comes to our servers will be uh, enriched and duplicated around four times for Kafka, and uh, we do all of that on 20 clusters spanning on 400 AWS uh, instances. Uh, pretty much, yeah. those numbers are a bit higher today, 450. So that comes out to around 70 billion requests a day. Uh, it's large scale. Hold on. So uh, this slide, uh, if you're new to the company, you probably haven't seen it yet, but uh, the hockey stick is one of uh, Oren's favorite uh, slides. He keeps saying, all our graphs look like hockey sticks, uh, income, uh, income, revenue, number of employees, number of customers, but he never says uh, incoming traffic. And um, one thing you should know about AppStar r and is that it's always going to catch up with the business. There's a lot of, uh, there's a cycle of growth and catch up that we do because uh, business is always ahead of us, business is good, but that creates a lot of uh, unique challenges. And the one true constant uh, throughout the years has been Kafka. We even changed, uh, we changed the databases that we've used and uh, other solutions. We even changed our main programming language uh, over the years, but Kafka has always been there. So, um, how do we do all this magic? Um, so this is a very simplistic overview of uh, uh, AppSpire architecture. Um, up top you see all the mobile phones, the uh, earphones sending the data to our web handlers. Uh, these web handlers are hiding behind uh, AWS ELDs. And their sole purpose is accepting this data uh, returning 200 or redirect to your mobile phone, and then just uh, producing uh, all this data into Kafka. Kafka first stop. Um, it won't be the last stop for these messages. And then Kafka distributes the data all around our uh, architecture. 
we have our uh, attribution engine, which is uh, do our attribution in real time. The reason for that is uh, you ever clicked on an ad for application and in Thailand, and you install the, one of those travel applications, you want the app to open in the right context. So yeah, what they do is they help the app ping our uh, servers and see from which app you install the app. So that position has to work very fast, but uh, it's all from Kafka. We also have the postbacks that we report directly to our partner servers and to our uh, customer servers. All the, app, uh, all the marketing campaigns work uh, in real time, so a lot of our uh, customers, the most sophisticated ones, do uh, real-time optimizations of uh, marketing campaigns. So there's a lot of money writing on that, so we always have to be up, and uh, Kafka has proven very stable uh, over the years. And uh, we have um, we write for that was three to be used by later analytics from Spark, you know, Druid, and Dickhouse, uh, ingesting that directly from Kafka. So it's a very major part of our system. And there's a nice book that I always like to mention. That, um, if, the, if your production system is a body, then Kafka would be the circulatory system. It's the way um, all data moves around. The production system. So it's a nice uh, little uh, image for you. All right. So let's zoom in a bit about our uh, Kafka. So this is how uh, things used to be in Axlar. We started uh, in a very naive way. We had a uh, few clusters that were big. Um, we had uh, application factor two or application factor Three and the important topics, the ones with the most business value that we couldn't afford any hint of uh, even a data integrity loss. We got this one application factor two and the debug topics and less important topics uh, were based on application factor two. And um, this is a good way to start. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Important stuff on the main uh, cluster, the less important stuff on registration factor two. And, um, it, it worked for a long, long time, but it's not sustainable. At a certain point, at a certain scale, uh, these clusters, they get too big. There's too many teams working on them and uh, causing interference. Uh, if one, uh, one developer uh, has a bug, it gets stressed on the cluster, and interferes with the rest of the teams. So it's not, it's not something that's sustainable. So we knew we had to find uh, a different uh, a different way to work instead of having these monolithic clusters. Uh, and we're, talk we're gonna see what we did in a few uh, moments. Um, also, if there's a, a broker outage, and then it affects all flows, and not just a, uh, an isolated part of the cluster. But so this is uh, this was our starting point. All right. Uh, one more thing you should know about AppSquare is uh, we do on-call shifts. Uh, who here does on-call? All right, so we have a lot of new people in the crowd that still don't do on-call. Um, lucky bastards. But um, there's two things you should know about on-call. The second worst thing that can happen to you when you're on-call is uh, having a, an, alert, an, alert, an alert on your phone for something that would have been avoided. And the worst thing that can happen is having that alert pop up at 3 a.m. So you can imagine my horror when I inherited the uh, legacy Kafka system. It was doing a lot of noise, and I had to take uh, its shifts. But some good news. Uh, Kafka just works. Uh, it works really well out of the bat uh, with you know, vanilla configurations. Uh, and the basic configuration they will fit, I'd say, around 80% of use cases. Um, it really, there's really a critical point where, um, where the effects of the tuning Kafka become really apparent, and uh, we reached it. So um, let's see one of those. So. 
Um, a year ago, I had the pleasure of uh, joining one of our teams that was doing uh, profiling for one of our uh, legacy uh, services. Uh, this service was doing around 20 million, was producing around 20 million uh, requests uh, a minute to our uh, Kafka brokers. And um, one of the first things I noticed was it was um, a producer was configured with uh, default check configurations. So immediately we changed uh, two parameters. We changed the uh, batch size in the uh, linger MS. And if you don't know, uh, batch size is the amount of data the producer uh, sends to the broker. And linger is uh, the amount of time the producer allowed, uh, allows itself to accumulate messages before it ships them off to the brokers. So basically we gave our broker, uh, uh, our producers more time to accumulate messages and send them in one batch to our brokers. And, and you can see here the load average on our brokers for that cluster dropped significantly after that change, almost uh, 50%, um, giving us a lot more time to work with that uh, cluster prolonging its uh, life expectancy. Um, a side effect is that because we compress our, uh, our data on the producer side, um, the compression was more effective on larger on larger batches, so we ended up saving uh, on disk space on our brokers. Um, so that last last slide, um, these are pretty much the numbers. We also did these tests to find the sweet spot, but uh, Netflix did it first and they did it better. So uh, if you take a picture of one slide from uh, uh, here tonight, this is the slide. Um, Show it to your boss and he found, um, yeah, I found a way to uh, immediately uh, boost our performance. So, sleep driven design. Um, what do we need for sleep driven design? We need three things we need improved infrastructure, we need great visibility into what's going on in our uh, system. We need uh, great tooling or automation. Uh, so whenever there is an issue, just click on a button and it does all the work for us and we don't have to make sure that we did the right command on the right, uh, in the right order. All these two, uh, together should result in stagers. And uh, at the end of the show, we're gonna see if that works. So improved infrastructure. Do any of you guys know who this is? <laughs> so Ethan knows uh, this is uh, Ruby Sharma, the captain of the uh, Indian uh, national cricket team. And uh, the reason uh, a lot of uh, veteran uh, developers in Africa know who this guy is is because a year ago we signed uh, an Indian uh, sports streaming app. And Indians are crazy, crazy about cricket. And um, I didn't believe this until I saw it, but uh, at our scale, I thought that traffic surges were impossible, basically. And it would take a unique uh, event to create it. But basically, whenever this guy stepped up clay, it's your traffic spike of 20%. So um, they really took us to our limit. We put a lot of stress on the system. And uh, for two months, whenever the national team was playing, we have people talking about it. Reminder, tomorrow we have a cricket game, and uh, we have it in the calendars, and we plan ahead. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so, so this event actually, uh, uh, it was a catalyst. Uh, and we took the, we, we saw that we were a little under provisioned in most of our uh, main clusters, so we decided to upgrade and enlarge uh, most of them, and uh, we took the opportunity to change the architecture. Um, yeah. But it was a tight schedule. Uh, we started in September, and immediately we had the Asia Cup of cricket. And then, um, what else? Oh yeah, 11 11, the Global Shopping Day, Rally Express, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Christmas. So all these events are unique by their own, but 
their proximity to each other uh, created a, an interesting challenge. So we started uh, started uh, moving to the north picture and increasing our uh, instances, and uh, we ended up with a 200 percent uh, increase. And um, this is a this is a place for a very important note. Um, I always hear developers talking about performance and how, yeah, I did performance testing and the machine worked. It took it to its limit. It did 300 uh, whatever uh, a second, and it's amazing. And I'm gonna put it in production. It's gonna be great, and um, that's great, but it's not production great. And um, having your brokers run at 90 percent, 80 percent capacity. It's bad production. Uh, it's bad production, basically. Uh, the right number, in my opinion, should be around 50, 60, maybe 70, depending on your budget, in order to be able to uh, deal with these uh, traffic spikes, deal with uh, hardware failures, deal with uh, bugs. Um, if you're running at 90%, you're just risking a domino effect on your cluster. So. Uh, that's the reason we have to increase uh, so, by so many instances. And right now we're running at 60% of most clusters and it should last for hopefully six more months. All right, so uh, we provisioned a lot of new clusters, but we also uh, started paying uh, some technical debt back. Uh, we were running uh, in global mode with uh, 0 0.10 and 0 0.8 messages on our uh, brokers. So basically the brokers are to uh, convert the incoming messages to the old uh, format. And uh, we did a lot of stress on our, uh, on our brokers. And um, you can see here the request handler average idle percent. This is basically how many threads we have to handle incoming traffic. There were a few instances where we got close to zero, and uh, if you get to zero, uh, you're dropping traffic, you're losing traffic. So it's not a good place to be at. Um, so we continue to uh, transition and we remove this uh, mixed mode. And uh, this is after, this is a comparable sized cluster doing the same work. And uh, this is on the day of uh, the AliExpress sale and the cricket game. And um, this was a uh, record day for events. I think we reached around 80 billion a day. Um, so you can see it was, uh, it was no problem for us. So, pay your technical debt. In our case, we started transitioning a year and a half ago. Um, but we didn't have uh, an owner for the process. So it was kind of abandoned in the middle. Um, so, thanks for uh, the cricket. We, pushed everybody to move and uh, we almost eliminated all of the uh, legacy system uh, from our staff. Okay, so remember the monolith. Uh, let's see what it turned uh, what it turned into. All right, uh, so <laughs> So breaking up the model. Uh, so we knew we couldn't uh, keep going on uh, the same trajectory and enlarging our clusters and putting more and more topics on them. So uh, we went the other way. We went to the producer, uh, uh, the producing teams, the ones that produce the data are the cluster owners. Um, and uh, basically what we did is uh, we fragmented that monolithic cluster into a lot of mini clusters. The topics are now placed by affinity to the flow. Uh, so we have uh, specific clusters for specific flows in the system. Uh, team, R&D teams can have multiple uh, clusters for multiple flows. And there's a lot of benefits here. Uh, first and foremost, isolation. We have a, a broker failure on one of the mini cluster, it doesn't fit the others. If uh, somebody pushes in bad code and uh, he starts using all the resources of the cluster, it won't affect other flows. It, uh, so production issues are contained, uh, and they're much easier to handle. And 
if you ever try moving out of a cluster with 100 topics and seven RNG teams <laughs> to a different 100 topic cluster, um, I don't suggest that experience. It's very hard to orchestrate, and this allows a lot of um, freedom to work with teams and uh, <coughs> coordinate better. Okay, so that's uh, that's a major plus. Uh, one more thing is um, basically if uh, if before that this monolithic cluster with all the topics on it. That was the pipeline. Um, Kafka now becomes part of the pipeline. It's still a rigid part. It's really hard to, to scale up. And um, we're going to talk about Kafka to scale a little bit, uh, a little bit later. But it's, this model started a, a philosophy, a thinking shift uh, in our R&D culture. So now Kafka is just part of the system. It's a big part, uh, but you can just you can add one, you can remove a cluster, and you can sh play around and shift with it, and uh, it becomes part of the pipeline. So it's it's basically infrastructure as a, as a service now. You know, a team needs more. A team needs a new cluster for a new feature. Fine, you provision it. And there's no problem. Um, just for uh, as an example, or. Uh, People-based attribution team came to me and they said, "Yeah, we need uh, we need a cluster. We're going to have one billion events on uh, beta a day. You know, one billion events a day is, is pretty high scale. But what's very wrong? What if it's five times that, a hundred times that? So having their own cluster, they won't affect us uh, uh, other flows. If they made a mistake, so it's uh, it's much better for us." All right. So, uh, greater visibility. Um, let's talk about metrics. Um, so, here's a real for you. Uh, what's wrong here? Uh, this is the request handler average uh, that we've seen before, and this is uh, the legend, basically. Anyone? All right, so it was. It took me a long time to figure it out as well. Uh, we're missing brokers. We don't have five, six, seven. We don't have nine. We don't have twelve and thirteen. And uh, this is really a, a sixteen uh, node cluster, and we only have like eight nodes reporting metrics. So what happened is we had an old uh, metrics plugin for our Kafka brokers that died randomly. And uh, we didn't know. And um, the only way to revive it was to restart the whole uh, service. So I don't recommend doing that in production at all. So we knew we had to uh, find something else. And uh, so we moved to uh, pulling our metrics from uh, JMX and uh, shipping them to Telegraph to Carmen. It's much more stable. We can restart the telegraph process from the outside as long as the JMX port is, uh, is open. So it's decoupled from the Kafka process. Uh, it's much healthier. And um, now we have a lot uh, more new shiny dashboards. So this is our uh, landing page, basically. Um, whenever there's a production issue or a hint of a production issue, uh, this is the first page I look at, uh, the first dashboard I look at in, uh, in our Rafana. Uh, it shows the major, the most important metrics in my opinion. Um, how many bytes are incoming total to the system, how many messages per, uh, per topic, uh, log flash stats, which is uh, how often we write to the disk, uh, load average, disk space, request handler, uh, idle percent. Uh, Leave change and other of the partitions. Um, we used to only uh, monitor disk space and unverified partitions, and by the time you see something wrong there, it's probably already too late. Um, yeah, we have a lot more dashboards. We have uh, a per topic uh, dashboard where we can see the producer and consumer behavior, uh, fetching and producing, and uh, how much uh, network is being taken up. 
Um, we have our inner workings. Uh, basically, this is local server metrics. It's a bit more uh, low level metrics. Uh, we usually only get here whenever there is a real issue. Um, but the thing is, um, broker metrics are only half of the story. In order to have a, a holistic view of the system, you have to see um, consumer and producer, uh, consumers and producer stats as well. So client metrics are important too, and um, this is just the dashboard of the Kafka producer metrics. We have our own uh, Kafka library that we use uh, for both producers and consumers, and it wraps the Java client, and we have uh, metrics based on top of that. But not all teams implemented it, and it's pretty new. And um, now we're going to see why uh, it's important to implement it. So um, this, this is actually a slide of a production issue we had a few months ago. Um, you can see that the bytes in jumped uh, significantly uh, compared to the, the day before. In an instant, the, uh, the traffic that the cluster was handling was around two times as much. And it, um, the manifest in that you see that we have uh, much less uh, um, threats to handle incoming traffic. We're getting to around 0 0.2, which is uh, out of, it's getting to be outside of our comfort zone. I consider enlarging this uh, cluster, but it happened, it happened overnight. Okay, so I get this call on Friday morning, of course it's Friday morning, uh, from one of our developers and he says, man, um, we have an issue with one of our services and I found nothing from our metrics, but I see that Kafka is struggling, can you look? So I'm looking and yeah, it's, it's working great, it's handling twice as much traffic, what do you want? Why is it handling twice as much traffic? Well. What you can see here, which was our major clue, was that the bytes in jumped uh, to be twice as much, but the messages in stayed the same. So message size grew up, uh, uh, grew to be two times as much as it was. How could that happen? Um, so in that case, it was a legacy system uh, as well, and somebody put all the configurations of the system on the message itself. And one morning, one of our biggest clients enabled 200 configura uh, integrations at once, and the message size balloons to be twice as much as it used to be. And if we had the uh, producer metrics for the service, it would have been really easy to see, hey, the message size uh, balloon, what gives? Uh, and they wouldn't have called me. So, I use this uh, opportunity to uh, to push the importance of metrics in uh, our standard uh, library. And uh, adoption rate is still slow, but whenever you can use uh, production issues to uh, promote your views. So, in the final trust, uh, moving on. Doing an automation. All right, so um, this section is missing one slide. Um, I, for me, it's so trivial that I didn't even think about putting it in the in the in the stock. But we use Terraform to handle all all the provisioning of our uh, infrastructure, and because it's so easy and convenient, uh, I forgot we do it. So that's the way we provision our infrastructure. So we're giving them credit before I continue. Terraform, there we go. All right, so we have all these metrics, so now we can have uh, alerts on all this uh, data that's incoming. And so we monitor now a bunch of stuff, all the key metrics that I showed you. Uh, this space, the request number of the value of the we have um, really low thresholds, so we can uh, preemptively uh, deal with um, production issues and we can see where that our clusters are getting to the uh, end of life cycle. So we have, if the typical threshold is many, we have a, a warning at, at 70 and we can deal with it during uh, work hours and not have it pop up at uh, 2 a.m. Uh, so, another achievement on that. 
Uh, alerts before we get paged. Um, so all these clusters uh, need managing. Um, Kafka Manager is a great tool by uh, Yahoo. And I highly recommend it. it uh, basically, it takes all the metrics that we have, the metadata on the cluster, and presents it in a nice way. Uh, I still prefer the command line, but most developers don't. Uh, so this took a lot of questions from me about uh, what's the configuration, uh, what's going on, is it spread properly? You can see it really easily via uh, this uh, tool. It really helps developers gain an insight on uh, the cluster, on their clusters. Um, so yeah. Yeah, uh, Kafka Gate API, we have our own in-house uh, middleware uh, that Elad Lug is uh, writing. Um, and it's going to be great. Gonna be, we're going to give developers the opportunity to uh, manage their clusters by themselves, create topics, uh, change and get the uh, topic configuration, a topic locator. Um, we have 20 clusters with hundreds of topics. Uh, nobody knows where the topics are anymore. So this is a great uh, feature. Uh, topic repetition for those days where you uh, set, size up your cluster. All right, uh, bonus, trust with uh, death teams. So a lot of you probably encountered this, uh, saying, oh, it works great. Why should we change anything? And uh, this is especially true for uh, infrastructure. Um, people are aware of the risk that comes with upgrading something. And um, sometimes it's really difficult to push uh, your changes out. So there are three things that you can do to make this make your life a little bit easier. And the first one is uh, it's pretty simple. It's just uh, be the best. You have to know your, uh, your material the best out of everybody. If you don't know, don't lie, don't make something up, say I don't know, go check it out. And uh, never let never let anybody doubt that you're uh, that you're the best in your area. Um, the second thing is uh, show the benefits. If we move to a new cluster and now there's less stages and the flow is better and the latency is down and, uh, and your team and you know, the team that owns that cluster is now benefiting from it. Uh, share it with your uh, R&D so other teams get envious and want to do this change as well. Uh, if it comes from the teams, it's much easier. So having one team being your uh, champion, your guinea pig, basically, uh, helps a lot. But in order to do that, you have to uh, you have to be really, really considerate of people's time. Uh, if you want to do a change, uh, box time in the calendar, plan it ahead. Don't come to the to the meeting and be like, uh, all right, so today we're gonna move up the cluster and then so how do we do that? Be ready with your plan. Um, it really helps streamline processes uh, requiring big teams. So did we succeed? We have less majors now. And the answer is yes, we did. Um, this is the amount of Kafka related pagers that we had. First uh, six months, we started upgrading around October. Um, this is outside of work hours. During work, we do a lot of noise. We break stuff when we fix it. And, uh, so we still had a few, a few uh, alerts at night. And um, so let's see what those were. AWS uh, hardware failures. And uh, they're always at 3 a.m., of course. Uh, by the way, it was uh, Vlad that received all three of them on different nights. <laughs> so now we can sleep like a baby. Uh, what's next? Okay. So, um, in order to avoid those uh, 3 a.m. hardware failures, we're checking out a tool called Dr. Kafka by Pinterest. And basically what it does is uh, auto-healing and uh, 
moving um, partitions from uh, sale brokers to other healthier uh, brokers. Um, we're testing it carefully because uh, if it doesn't work right, there's a lot of uh, bad implications for the business. And uh, one more thing is uh, AppsFlyer is now moving to uh, multi-region architecture. So we're using a uh, replicator uh, to uh, do that. It's still in the PLC phase, but that's a great tool by Uber. Um, we actually documented uh, all our uh, attempts at cross net uh, center replication. Uh, so if you want, go check it out. Uh, Kafka on Kubernetes uh, across the ocean. Um, it's a pretty nice uh, wrapper for it. Okay, so I promised I talked about a bit about uh, Kafka uh, scaling and Kafka cluster auto scale um, as well. And um, the reason we're talking about Kafka cluster auto scale and not just Kafka auto scale is um, Kafka is pretty really rigid. I mean, you can't really add brokers and then take brokers away from uh, from a cluster uh, on a daily basis because it's pretty hard to balance. And each time you re you move uh, partitions away, there's a there's a storm, a network storm of data moving around brokers, and uh, you can't really do it if uh, if you're experienced in uh, traffic search and you're under provision because it will only add stress to the system. So the next logical step would be, all right, so we don't size up the cluster, we, we bring up a bigger cluster or we bring up an equally sized cluster and then we split the traffic. Um, but in order to do that, there's a lot of moving parts that need to be finely tuned. Um, we're starting to design this. The first thing we would obviously need is some kind of um, topic uh, registry. Uh, that holds uh, which topics are hosted where on which clusters, and then you need smart, dynamic uh, consumers and producers that know that they need to produce or read from two clusters. And then how would you bring the cluster down when traffic is down? And there's a lot of orchestrating around this. And, uh, it's our holy grail, basically. This is uh, the end game for us. And we're starting to design it and work on it. Uh, and in the process, we're selling a lot of uh, unfinished business that we still have uh, to do on our own system. Uh, remember Kafka's team. Questions? All right, so the first question was uh, around the uh, message uh, schemas and um, this is a very painful part of uh, App Slayer history. Uh, basically, all our uh, message structure is unstructured. You know, people, uh, whenever they need it, they added uh, a flag here, uh, a field there, and it ballooned. And there's been a talk that uh, talks about unified message flow for, for ages, basically since before I was here. Um, every time somebody tried to approach it, you know, he quit. Uh, a few months later, maybe it's related, I don't know. Um, but it's definitely a good practice, and if you're starting from scratch, it's the best way to go uh, to enforce these schemas. Uh, but uh, we don't work with Confluence, uh, we use Apache uh, Kafka right now. Uh, we don't do manage uh, either because we want to become agnostic as much as possible. Um, it's definitely planned, but uh, the cost right now would be basically stopping R&D for three months, I think, and doing that. The benefits would be amazing, but uh, it's not our topic. It's good. And uh, the second question was, oh yeah, so 
Uh, we don't have a streamlined process right now. We can use uh, Kafka Mirror. It's pretty simple to set up. Um, maybe we should consider doing something that's more uh, available to uh, developers, really. Uh, and the next step beyond Kafka Mirror is, uh, is the new replicator by Uber. It basically does that. You just you connect to a topic and it moves, it duplicates it to a destination cluster. So there are solutions, we use them, uh, but there's not something that's uh, production grade for everyday use yet. So right now, public scaling is uh, we over provision. Uh, we run at sixty percent capacity. Sometimes. So, so the way we do scale right now is we provision a brand new cluster and uh, we just move all the producers and all the consumers. It, it is tedious. It does take two or three hours and it involves at least two teams. The team that's producing, the team that's reading, and data info that all that read all the data to the SP. And because it's such a waste of time, and because we have so many clusters, that's why we said, right, we need to automate this as well. Uh, so yeah, the first, the second option is adding more brokers, and it is possible. We do do it sometimes. Um, but it's uh, but if we scale too late, then it's uh, it's a tricky situation to do properly because of the overhead. So most companies, they would, uh, they would add brokers. We do that as well, but sometimes it's when you need to upgrade, um, when you need to upgrade the version of Kafka, then Doing a rolling restart is, uh, is tricky and painful, so we prefer to just move on. It's a mix of both. So, um, auto scale uh, is being done in very few companies. I know uh, Netflix, Pinterest, and uh, Grub are doing it. Um, we're, getting, we're getting to their size, so. All right, thank you.